welcome to death row. Like we always do about this time. <laughs> I'm gonna fight your fucking ass. You don't got your plan touch butt with that dork in the park. Ah, uh, there's a little snake in the grass. Hey, I'm not surprised, motherfuckers. No fucking Jesus, people. I'd like to take this chance to apologize to absolutely nobody. Hey, pussy, are you still there? I'm back. Who the fuck is that guy? Break out the red panties. Well, rich baby. I would like to introduce. Welcome to the MMA for Money Show, episode 33, covering UFC 40, Vendetta. Back when the UFC named the events like Terminator sequels, and in many ways, we were better for it. In the year 2002, Ken Shamrock was back in the UFC for the first time in six years, fighting against the new breed, Tito Ortiz, who hadn't fought since losing who hadn't lost since losing to Ken's brother, Frank, three years before. Tito had established quite the rivalry with the Lions Den, Ken's gym, after defeating Jerry Bolander and a redemptive fight against Guy Mesger. He had previously lost him in his second ever UFC fight. He's one of the few guys that all of his professional fights were in the UFC up until more recently. Now there's a little backstory for you guys going into the event that we're going to cover. I am Bob Voss at MMA State of Mind, your favorite garbage man, your corona facing garbage man really any, any way you want to put that uh, i'm here with uh at don't cope just win mike copenhaver how are you doing man i'm doing phenomenal bro just happy to be here with you to talk about some old school ufc and just get my mind off this covid madness because i'm getting a little stir crazy being all locked up oh yeah and i guess anyone within the sound of our voices i guarantee you're getting a little stir crazy uh the only reprieve i have is i am still going out and working so i'm still going out in it so i have a little reprieve but still being locked in on the weekends and seeing the kids locked in and getting all of that's going a little nuts but that's one of the great things about going back to these old ufc events especially like ones we've previously gone over or we're gonna talk about 40 now or basically everything up until about ufc 150 ish because then the cards were still stacked and you'll hear that as we go over this one all the names that are on this one so we are going to go over I'll at least give the results of every fight, and we'll go a little bit further into uh, probably the last five on the fight card. Uh, I do have odds for some of these because they did post odds. Uh, The hardest thing was to find the precise odds. They actually displayed the odds on the broadcast, at least for the top three fights. So that's what I have listed. Um, And we'll be able to give you a little bit of backstory on just about any of these. Now, if any of you remember from last week's show, We decided to do UFC 40 Vendetta because this is the first fight card that Mike was at live. So he'll be able to give you guys some backstory on that. And next week, we're going to go over Pride FC 33 just for it being such an amazing card. And we want to fit a little bit of pride in there. And then after that, we're going to go to UFC 126, which was the first UFC event I was at live. So getting a little bit of firsthand experience for all you guys. So uh, in the first, uh, Mike, I'm going to quick ask before I go into him. Do you have much to say for the early prelims, or do you just want me to do fast results for at least the first two before we get to Andre Arlovsky? Yeah, I mean, pretty much Andre Arlovsky was the highlight of the prelims. Uh, he was faced up uh, versus basically a nobody in Ian Freeman, so uh, it was pretty cool to watch him just uh, beat the crap out of him. Yeah, for some, like for just the results, I suppose... Uh, Philip Miller defeated Mark Weir by second round. Rear naked choke, he pretty much dominated the ground game for the most part. Um, Weir being more of a stand-up guy. Miller controlled most of the first round and most of the second. He was in a slight bad spot in the second before he was able to reverse, start throwing down some ground and pound, and when Weir rolled uh, to all fours, he Miller sunk in the rear naked choke. Uh, Vladimir Matyushenko, who really anybody who's been a UFC fan for even as long as even probably going back five years, he was still in the UFC. Um, Matt Yushenko defeated Travis View, a long-time MMA guy, by first-round submission via punches. So, yes, there was a tap-out to punches. Those don't happen nearly as often anymore, but, you know, it's still every once in a while on a heavyweight Bellator fight or regional MMA, you'll see it for sure. And like Mike said, with the Andre Olowski finish of Ian Freeman in the first round, Ian Freeman kind of got launched to that because he had... Uh, first round submission win over Frank Mir in his previous fight. I believe that was the UFC's first trip to England. He was uh, basically the guy 
in British MMA. I believe it was Dan Hardy who said he was at that fight or one of Ian Freeman's UFC fights, and that's what got him into MMA. He was basically the first British MMA star just for the simple fact that he made it to the UFC. Um, Obviously, we blew some of those uh, pretty quick. But actually, before we go on to the next fight after that, which is even more exciting, this was right after... Dana White and Zufa Fertitas kind of took over the UFC not too long into that and they started bringing back some big names uh, that's why we'll talk about Ken Shamrock later on in this card and some other names like that but there was a big announcement in this one uh, timing wise I believe it was after the Andre Lefters fight where they talked about it but they were bringing back Tank Abbott for those of you who don't know about Tank Abbott he was a brawler who knocked people silly and had a long ridiculous goatee <laughs> he looked like the typical heavyweight, uh, overweight guy at a bar, but would just knock you the hell out. Mike, how'd you feel about the little bit awkward exchange between Joe Rogan and Tank Abbott, but bringing Tank Abbott back and then some of the other names that Dana White did early on? Well, if you're a, or a UFC fan, you always want to see Tank Abbott go at it, even though he's out of shape. But he always came uh, with some heavy heat and some heavy hands. So, I mean, it, it, it's always cool to see. Uh, I, you could start seeing the marketing start for the UFC, and they start really trying to, you know, put together matches and showcases to, you know, excite the fans and also to they start just throwing the OGs to the slaughterhouse because even uh, Ken versus Tito at this time, you know, it wasn't really, uh, you know, Ken in his prime. So I never really fully say that Tito beat Ken in his prime ever. It just he just Tito beat Ken. How did you feel about, uh, I know they stopped doing this because they started packing out houses so they couldn't quite fit anymore, but how'd you feel about looking back when they still had the ramp going down and even had the pyros going out indoors? Because you were there for that. I've never been to a UFC fight that actually had pyros going off. How was that? I can tell you, dude, it's so much more exciting to see the pyros going off. And, you know, some of these these big fighters at that time, you know, like I was just a kid, man. I was, I was like just lucky to be 17. My brother was 21 training the lines then. And so I uh, just just being there with the fans, it reminded you more of like a WWE, WWF match and uh, in the sense of the walkouts. And I like that, man. It's uh, really cool. You could see uh, Tito and Ken uh, ducking on the ramp before the the, the fog comes. It was uh, one of the most exciting uh, of uh, fights and atmospheres watching uh, Ken and Tito alone. It wasn't my favorite fight on the card. We'll get into that later, but it was still an awesome, awesome moment. And now briefly going back into uh, Andre Lofsky and even Freeman before we move on to even more exciting fights. This actually, Honestly, this um, was stoppages or corner stoppages or submissions all around. Uh, this was back when you wouldn't even get to see these early prelims, but since so many fights ended so quickly, they started just filling them in uh, to eat up time on the pay-per-view. But uh, Andre Lofsky... When he was coming in here to fight Ian Freeman, he actually had just lost to Pedro Hizo. Uh, actually, back-to-back losses once to Rico Rodriguez and then to Pedro Hizo after getting his first win in the UFC. He would had those two losses and then came back with a win against Ian Freeman. And they had high hopes for him, even though he was still early on in his career. After this, he would fight Vladimir Matyushenko and then was supposed to fight for the title against uh, Tim Sylvia, but that got canceled. And then uh, had a replacement fight and then... St- beat Tim Sylvia, became champion, and then that started the run of Andrei Arlovsky being Andrei Arlovsky. And back when he was the man and had his flowing hair, and he was just, he was the man. And uh, even he was one of the few fighters that, although he wasn't from here, he lived in downtown Chicago, and he was the first like UFC star that resided here. And uh, obviously he wasn't mainstream here by any means but there was there was some connections there and he started getting uh, a little bit of shine ian freeman obviously not as much uh after losing this fight like we said he had beaten frank mir going into this one but uh then he had the loss under Orlovsky, had one win in a random organization was gonna fight ken shamrock but that got canceled had a draw versus vernon white and then kind of just bumped around for a little bit never made it back to the ufc had some cage rage fights has a pretty horrific loss to melvin manhoff if you ever want to check that one out but never made it back to the ufc uh his most recent fight was in uh 2013 was a loss to rico rodriguez who as a little side note uh 
this was really obviously Mike said perfectly this was when they really started advertising a lot more and really pushing the popularity of the UFC and trying to get stars there even to the point that they had Vin Diesel there yes for all you the all those of you who remember him coming for Ronda Rousey he had been there before this was right after Triple X came out and he was actually a action star because he was buddies with Rico Rodriguez who trained with Tito so all the little connections there um but honestly, the next fight is by far much more exciting. I'll actually throw that to Mike to describe first. I'll just quick give you the rundown of what happened and throw it to him. Robbie Lawler got a TKO victory over Tiki Gosen in the very first round. Mike, break down that fight and honestly just like how that was to see live. Well, man, this, is, this was my absolute favorite fight on the card, uh, going back to it all. I mean, Robbie Lawler uh, reminded me so much of my brother at that time, uh, except for much more uh, mixed in the sense of all-around uh, fighting skills. And so he just he was so much uh, just a brawler, just like Mike Tyson, but in mixed martial arts. He, he just was so hungry. He was a crazy, crazy young, thin, uh, you know, he wasn't thin in the sense of, like, skinny, but he's just so ripped, man. Um, this fight, when it started, they were both kind of gun shy, feeling each other out. And, uh, you know, I, in the sense of you can understand that because one hit from one of them, you're going to just end up on the floor or wobbly. And then, uh, but Robbie ended up uh, coming through and, or colliding and hitting him first and just pretty much ending uh, Gosen's lights or ending his night really quickly. It was literally just a crazy knockout. You could see uh, Robbie's emotions after he hit him not once but twice and or once after the I believe the ref grabbed him and stopped him. He uh st- or right before the ref grabbed him and stopped him, he hit him one more time and then he just jumped up and his emotions were just crazy it reminded me a lot of uh the original ufc emotions when people like it was just so raw and ruthless and you, you really didn't um know what was going to happen so i i just love this is when i fell in love with robbie lawler and i knew he was going to just be an absolute animal especially by uh, the stuff that he says on the microphone i just knew he was just a an idiot but awesome he was 20 years old which will robbie lawler was 20 years old and I guess uh, for a little connection, it's like this was back when Miltich was king and his guys were the guys. This was their young gun. You could see him in the background. You could see Miltich there. Hughes fights later on the night. You see um, a gosh based on his name. Oh, it'll come to me in a little bit. Obviously, Tim Sylvia was there too, but I'm spacing on the 55er. Uh, well, we'll get back there. Um, but as Mike referred to, I'm going to try if I can get the quote right. I was trying to get back and actually play the clip for you guys. Didn't quite work out that way. But when he got the win, obviously, Rob Lawler is so excited. He gets on the mic, 20-year-old kid, and starts screaming about how he just had to wait. He knew that when he was going to come, he was going to come hard, and he came hard. And just started screaming and all kinds of excited. And obviously he didn't quite get the double entendre right there. But that's okay. And it was so... How much power this kid had. I mean, I say kid. He's older than me, obviously. Especially now. But the initial shot that put down Tiki Ghost. And like I tried to replay it a couple times. It almost looks like he doesn't even make contact with his fist. It's almost like the back part of his palm hits the side of his head. And the dude just goes down. And then... I don't know if they mic'd the canvas or what, but you can hear the connected shot uh, hitting Gosen in the head and hitting him into the mat and then hitting the mat this time after that. Like, it was a bang, man. Like, it sounded like uh, when you have seen professional wrestling, the guys just land on the mat and that loud bang sounded just like that. And the follow-up shot would have put him away for sure. And then T. Gosen and his super awkward going on the mic afterward and saying that it was stopped due to the cut above his eye and not that he was brutally knocked out. So how'd you feel about that, Mike, with Tiki trying to play it off like it was a cut and not a concussiveness? Yeah, that's when you really tell that people shouldn't get on the microphone after they get knocked out. He just, uh, you know, didn't have a clue really what happened. And uh, some competitors, man, they just don't want to admit to losing. And it's really sad to see. You'll see it in wrestling, too, uh, in high school and throughout as a a youngster. uh, People that just are so competitive that once they lose, they just they refuse to believe that it happened or uh, make all kinds of excuses. But it is what it is, man. He got straight laid out. But like you said, it was a wild punch from Robbie Lawler. It wasn't necessarily like a straight right or beautiful left like he has now. It was just a maniac throwing bombs. Well, that's a good point you did about interviewing the guy who just got knocked out. But I don't know if it was to fill time. I'm trying to remember back. I guess we'll see when we watch some more older fights. 
I guess I didn't remember them interviewing the loser as much as they did on this fight card. Like, they almost interviewed the winner and loser on every single fight. I mean, I know the fights were ending quick, so maybe they were just trying to fill time. But, yeah, pretty much every single time they interviewed the winner and the loser, some starting with the loser and then going to the winner. It, it was kind of an odd back and forth. Um, obviously, Tiki, Go- Tiki Gozen, if you guys do not know, he was a longtime uh, punishment guy. He was one of Tito Ortiz training partners and he is actually now uh an mma manager managing the likes of rampage and a few other guys for all you people who don't know punishment was tito ortiz deal and it was kind of starting at this point now with tito uh rico rodriguez tiki goes in uh, i'm not sure if at this point rampage was part of that but rampage was part of that rob mccullough uh, from wec fame a lot of big guys were involved in that and tiki goes was kind of their guess his he was their mascot because he was that guy that was there that i guess was, was never really that good um kept fighting and anyone who was into the ufc whether it be starting at ufc 40 or even later he was like a coach on probably a third of the seasons of the ultimate fighter because he had so many mma and ufc connections um going on to more early finishes. Uh, Carlos Newton got the round one Kimura victory over Pete Spratt. Pete Spratt coming in, talking all kinds of bravado that these guys don't want to stand and strike and they can't stand and strike with him. And Well, that's fine. He got subbed in the first round. And actually, Newton's hands looked pretty good early on. Uh, they really fed Newton to the Wolves early on. Uh, the Ronin. We will actually know, uh, go into him a little bit more because he also fought. Like He kind of jumped back and forth between the UFC and Pride. He was one of the first guys to really do that. But, um, they, I mean, he got fed to the Wolves really early on. Like, his second UFC fight. I mean, it was in a tournament, but he had lost a split to Dan Henderson in his, I think, fourth ever UFC fight. Then he had to fight Sakuraba in Pride 3. And, like, he... he fought the who's who basically he fought he lost to dave benet um although i think there was a submission only he was the one who beat um pat militish was the first one to do so for the welterweight title uh, and then subsequently lost to matt hughes it was in that slam ko that technically both him and hughes were both out although they called hughes the winner he came right back with a win and this was back when there wasn't a ton of guys in the higher levels of each division so it's like if you got a guy with a name and he came off a win whether it be in a different organization because the win that he got after this was in pride they would throw him right back in so then his very next UFC fight was against Matt Hughes again and this time he lost again it was a little bit closer but uh, lost in the fourth round uh, rather than a second round slam this was his fight against Pete Spratt where he got a Kimura and you know what in his very next fight he was going to fight Anderson Silva so Carlos Newton really got fed to the Wolves I totally forgot he was one of the first UFC guys although many of them probably were that were super into Dragon Ball Z. He even called his fighting style Dragon Ball Jiu-Jitsu, which I always thought entertaining, and he ended uh, every fight that he won with a Kamehameha, throwing the hands out and getting super into it. Incredibly soft-spoken, but just a really good fighter uh, in the early goings. He eventually would fight for IFL, Pride, UFC, and just kind of jump back and forth uh, between all of them. I guess you could say he was the first like big Canadian star, but... Whatever. It was, it was an early win in this one, so we'll, we'll give him that one. Mike, how'd you feel about this fight? How impressive was the submission? Because Pete Sprout would become somebody. This was, it wasn't against a nobody, so it's big kudos to Carlos Newton on that one. Yeah, Pete Sprout was a tough dude, and uh, Carlos Newton, it was the first time I've ever seen a Kimura um, at all. You know, I, I was... In- you know, in competition, you don't really see that maneuver often pulled off. And for uh, us to see it live, I, I didn't fully understand what exactly happened. If he, he broke his wrist or his elbow or his shoulder. But now that I know the full extent of it, I mean, for him to pull off a Kimura in UFC 40, it, w- it was super impressive. And uh, Pete Spratt was a tough dude uh, down the road. Uh, he ended up being a really good striker. I believe he's from New York, if I'm uh, not mistaken. But either way, it was a great submission. Now we're getting into the fights that we actually have odds for. And honestly, it's a, it's a little odd how this one got ordered, but this, this happened a little bit more uh, in the UFC. So we have three fights more to talk about. Two of them are title fights. So you would think that the highest two would be the main and co-main event. The UFC always used to do it, and still sometimes, but not always, the higher weight goes in the main event spot the lower weight goes in the co-main event spot but you know this one's a little bit different you got a welterweight title fight 
in the co-co main event, uh, the co-main event with Chuck Liddell uh, fighting Hanato Sobral, and then obviously the main event with Tito Ortiz, Ken Shamrock. Re- basically, the whole reason it was called Vendetta uh, with uh, Tito Ortiz issue with the Lions Den, and then obviously the losses to uh, Ken's brother Frank. But the first one we have odds for is Hillsboro Numero Uno Celebrity. Which, if you know anything about Hillsboro, like, that's not really saying much. No offense to anyone if you're listening to here from Hillsboro. You can't hate me. My brother-in-law is from there. My His parents run the newspaper, so you can't get mad at me. Um, Matt Hughes was a minus 450 favorite to defend his title against the former middleweight challenger, Gil Castillo, who was plus 350. Uh, he defeated him with cut Dr. Stoppage in the first and second round. It was a terrible stoppage. Um... And honestly, as weird as it is, like I remember the older UFCs being so much more brutal and the stoppages coming so late, but I guess that was before some of the enacting of the rules because in some of these fights, the, 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 the ref stopped the fight super fast. Like the moment, like even going back to the Robbie Lawler fight, he dropped him, had one follow-up shot, missed the second one, and before, like even as he's throwing the second one that missed, the ref's jumping in. Gosen was probably out, but you see so many more follow-up shots in... I guess today's MMA, which I always thought was odd, so I guess we kind of ebbed and flowed with that. Uh, Matt Hughes was super dominant. Uh, the main reason they gave Gil, C- Gil Castillo this fight, he was a uh, Gracie, they kept saying Gracie expert. They would never say his belt. Like, just over and over again, they said Gracie expert, Gracie expert, Gracie expert. Um, he had fought uh, Dave Manet for the middleweight title. Blood and Guts did so great in the fight. Gas later against the bigger man because he didn't cut any weight to get down there. Um, it's actually really funny. I'm not sure how much hyperbole it was, but Joe Rogan kept going on and on and on about how Gil Castillo was going to have a good chance of beating him, and it was a super, super close fight with crazy wide odds. And But this was back when Joe didn't really count wrestling for, for much in, in general and always went with the jujitsu, I suppose. Um, Mike, what was your take on that fight? How did you feel about that doctor stoppage for what borderline seemed like a nick rather than a cut? Yeah, this was one of the more disappointing fights on the card because I really wanted to see Matt Hughes, uh, you know, pick him up across the cage and slam him and just do some real, real damage with elbows. And so when this got stopped, we were just pissed off because we wanted to see more. Uh, I think it's funny they called him a Gracie Jiu-Jitsu expert. Uh, You know, uh, he ended his career as a white belt in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, so he never went far at all. And so it's funny they called him a Jiu-Jitsu expert or whatever they were doing, but that's usually when they're blowing smoke up your ass and trying to deflect what he really is. So uh, it was a major mismatch, in my opinion, and just a, just a feeding for Matt Hughes. Matt Hughes was an absolute monster at that time, and there was literally no one uh, just barbaric enough to stop him, and he just had that great wrestling. So it, it was what it was, but it sucked because we wanted to see a real fight, and uh, that little nick was nothing nowadays. They have people like with their skull hanging out. Well, especially because given its location, like if they showed it, like it, was, it wasn't in the eyebrow, it was almost at the side of the head, a little bit higher than the eyebrow. Like, to get blood in the eye, he would basically have to lay on his opposite side and, like, tilt his head in just such a way for the blood to even get into his eye and affect his vision. Like, there were cuts in different points of this on the card that I, I thought we were, you would be much more likely for it to get stopped for something like that. But, I mean, this was, yeah, obviously, this is when Matt Hughes was an utter wrecking ball. I mean, utter other than having... Just the kryptonite of Dennis Hallman, who for whatever reason were always able to beat Matt Hughes. Other than that particular losses, he only had one loss other than the Dennis Hallman ones. He was after this fight, he went to 33 and 3. And he was riding a let's even see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 fight win streak going into this fight, including the two wins over uh, Carlos Newton and having the win over Sakurai and just starting to get more and more names on his list. Like, he was the man. He even talked about he was going to be fighting Sean Shirk going forward, and he even, he fought, ended up fighting him at UFC 42. Yeah, still utterly shocked about the the cut stoppage, uh, even probably worse so than normal uh, Rogan. Any time there was even a slight hint at a partial submission, he would freak out for the split second where it was almost even kind of touching it, but not really. Oh, man, I'm sorry. I I was on mute at the time, but if you could have heard how hard I was laughing when Mike said that he never made it higher than a white belt, I was borderline crying 
Because so it makes sense why they would never actually say what belt he was. They just kept saying that he was trained by the Gracies, and you got to watch out for that Gracie Jiu Jitsu. I'm like still like milking that name because it would still be another. Let's see, when did they have him actually fight Hoist Gracie? That was at UFC 6 2006. So it was be four years from now that they actually have um, Hughes fight Gracie. Oh man, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm still laughing about it. That made me laugh. <laughs> yeah, dude, it's but, so funny that they try to deflect that. But I mean, Wikipedia just speaks for itself, so it sucks for him. Oh, absolutely, and thank you for that little bit of info. That's why, like, I I, I was borderline upset. I'm like, you guys keep in almost any other, even current UFCs, like they talk about a guy's jujitsu. They almost always say what belt he is because they almost always know, and they tout it if it's purple or higher basically and oh man i'm sorry that I'm, I'm still laughing at that oh man but yeah man matt hughes was such a absolute workhorse and they talk about it going into it that he was actually super excited that there was a bigger fight later on in the card so that it didn't all fall on him and he could just go and fight and win and then go back to the farm i've seen the farm it's a nice farm and all but i don't know i i never understood matt hughes as a person from any story that I've heard from people that know him, know him, or from other, he always has just seemed kind of like an odd guy. Especially if you ever want an inside, he's on super that. weird. Oh yeah, if you ever want a, weir- on a, a unique insight on him, I believe it was basing on his name too. Uh, there is a not just on, uh, I think it's a sure dog or bloody elbow thread where a former fighter, a uh, heavyweight, Sean McCorkle. There you go. Sorry, wasn't clicking. He rewent through. Matt Hughes' biography and gave a synopsis of each chapter one by one, but like reading it how a normal person would read it, not like from Matt Hughes' perspective. It's real messed up. So if you ever want to laugh, it's a faster way to read through that book and it'll make you laugh at the sheer ridiculousness of it. A uh, story I heard at one point was Matt Hughes was at, this is not from his book, this is from someone who knows him, that he was at a they had this massive reunion at the high school of anyone who had or gone there was currently going there like a big old party and it was when he was already in the ufc i believe he was champion at that point and someone was just kind of messing with him a little bit kind of like poking the bear nothing too crazy but just poking the bear and he just snapped harpooned the guy elbowed him across the face to knock him out and then just walked away so he had he had a little bit of a short fuse as well no matter how well-mannered he seemed on the broadcast (laughs) Uh, and, I mean, Gil Castillo, obviously Matt Hughes became such a UFC mainstay and not so much for um, Gil Castillo, although his last fight was apparently to Jake Ellenberger in 2006, although obviously that was a loss. But let me think, where did they have him go after Matt Hughes? He had two wins after that, but he took four months off fought again that year and then basically fought once a year after that till 2006 and then was just done but i mean he had he he did have a decent amount of cachet going in i mean he before the dave Manet loss he was undefeated at 5-0 and with a win over nate marquardt uh that was before nate Car- marquardt was nate marquardt but still and never won beat another name after that so i guess he was the not the what if but because i want to say he was 36 going into this fight so not a spring chicken. So in the co event, which had was not for a title, but I guess had title implications, uh, Chuck Liddell was a minus 320 favorite. He put his number one contender status on the line, as if that's something you could actually do, but they made a very big point about that on the broadcast. He defeated Hanato Sobral, who was plus 250, uh, with a TKO, uh, starting with a head kick, borderline a knee, but a head kick with follow-up ground and pound. Mike, how electric was that finish for you in there? Obviously, this was during the start of, like, the myth that was Chuck Liddell. Man, uh, the Iceman back then in the day, dude, was an absolute savage. It was just, uh, he was one of the first pre- people that w- had, was so confident in his wrestling and his striking that he, he really, you, he knew he was you weren't going to take him down and he was just going to punish you. And uh, that that's what he did to Soberall. And he was so good at faking and fainting back then that th- these guys just had no clue what he was doing. And the setup for the kick was just amazing. And uh, the Iceman, the, the savagery of him going in there to, to hurt him more... It, 
it just shows you the what what we all fell in love with with Chuck, and it also uh, gave us a little setup for what we were about to see with uh, Tito and Chuck a couple times down the road, and that's what I really wanted to see uh, at that time because uh, I was friends with, with and my brother was so close with Ken Shamrock, we really didn't want to see the, the the that type of fighter in his prime versus Ken not in his prime. So uh, when we finally got to see uh, the Tito type Chuck matchup it was going to be much more fun but Chuck Liddell was an absolute monster that night and uh, you knew he was for real because he actually fought I believe uh, Soberall was a crazy jiu-jitsu black belt at that time or something a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt but either way it was an absolutely amazing uh, performance by the Iceman and just his fainting and the, the fake for the kick and it was just it was a different moment when you saw the Chuck Iceman uh, in person completely agree with that and i'm not sure if he was a black belt i know he was a decent level uh gracie jiu-jitsu at that point i don't think he was a black belt he obviously is by now i know what he had going for him was he was also like on the brazilian national wrestling team something like that so he had a nice little blend of ground game uh with submission and had some pretty good hands and i had to do a double take because i remember watching wasn't quite prime time yet it was before they had ufc prime time but it was something similar to that i'm trying to remember uh was it i think it was ufc all access they were interviewing him it was a kind of a day in the life while he was prepping to fight chuck liddell and i'm like is that the same one it doesn't look the same even like going back and watching this it doesn't look the same but it was for the second time they were going to fight where they filmed him for that so i don't know if they had him pegged as he might win that second time around or putting a little bit of extra money into him or what because i remember watching that and like getting, being super intrigued by him and like getting excited about the fight not realizing at the time because this was before i was watching live fights that they had fought before um and honestly the fight ended very similarly i actually uh chuck actually finished him faster uh in that fight the finish was beautiful uh, if you want to go back to it he really had sabral focus completely on his hands and left him wide open for the kick. Like, he, he wasn't even looking. And he tried to throw a kick of his own and was just worried about those follow-up punches and just drew him right in and landed. And it was beautiful. And it was all what we wanted from Chuck Liddell, who went on the mic afterwards. That he doesn't care if it's Ken Shamrock. He doesn't care if it's Tito Ortiz who wins and he gets the title. It's like whoever it is, he's fighting next and he's knocking him out. Um, I hate to break it to everyone, but that is not what happened next. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll get to uh, repercussions, especially because since this is a past event, we can give you guys some um, more recent history of what happens right after this. But obviously Chuck Liddell would be a mainstay at 205 for the foreseeable future, let alone a little bit of leasing over to Pride at some point. Now, the main event of UFC 40, the reason it was called UFC Vendetta, Tito Ortiz, who was only a minus 150 favorite, retained his light heavyweight title with a corner stoppage uh, against Ken Shamrock, who was plus 120, and the, the stoppage happened between round three and four. Now, round one and two started very... Si- well, okay, I'll take it back. Round two and three started very similarly, with Ken actually looking really good on the feet in the early goings, landing a little bit, and basically what would happen is every time... Tito would feel not comfortable. He would be able to get him to the ground. Not in the early goings in the first round. The early goings in the first round, he came right at him. I was actually really impressed. I forgot about Tito Ortiz's clinch work um, and how he seemed to be able to control him in the clinch. I do not remember him at this point in his career having much of a clinch game. And it was, wasn't was really until the uh, third round that he had him down that he got the real damage onto Ken, which re- eventually resulted with the stop in between rounds because they show him going back and you see all of the swelling and the cuts on the nose and all that kind of stuff but then then kudos to ken with how he ended it being very uh adamant about what a warrior tito was and saying that the the beef is buried and just come to terms with everything like such a class act at that point and this is one of the few times that tito actually reciprocated and was a little bit of a class act himself even though we all know most of the times if he got a win in the end he really wasn't so mike this was the main event of your first ever ufc live experience it had ken shamrock who you had connections with how was this one live Oh man, to this day, it's still one of the most exciting uh, events I've ever been to. I've been to NFL, been to NHL, been to MLB playoffs. I've I've been uh, almost to every sporting event possible. And the electricity for this match, uh, even though it didn't go the way that I wanted with Ken winning, it, it was it was unreal, dude. I, I just it still gives me chills to think about the electricity in the crowd. Um, 
you know, Ken, like you said, Tito, you know, he, he won, obviously. And uh, with Ken, uh, he was doing really well standing. And that's when, like you said, Tito would get hit by something Ken threw and he would go down for a takedown and uh, go to a position he felt more comfortable. And that's when I knew that we were going to kind of have a bad night because he, he really didn't want to stand with Ken. And that really was the chance for Ken to, to end the fight, in my opinion. And so it, it, it still was an, an amazing fight to go to the, like I said, the electricity with the fans and, you know, t uh, Tito and Ken selling the fight did both such a good job at that time for MMA being so young. Um, it, it's, it's just an amazing thing that I got to experience, uh, especially just thankful to my brother for taking me and, uh, I, I, you know, being able to go along for the experience uh, through all his career. So it's one of the, my favorite moments uh, just because I got to go and see all those legends fight but it, it wasn't when Ken lost but uh, it was still a great night because Ken always goes and has a, a part goes and parties and has fun after so whether he's beat up or not he's still coming now did you guys meet up with him after the fact oh yeah my we my brother I believe had a hotel room right next to him so we were with him uh, for a good amount of the night and yeah it, it's uh, the damage on his face is not something that you you want to you want to see often, and I believe the the second time they fought was even worse. Yeah, if memory serves, I'll quick open it up. But if I remember right, the next time they fought, it ended actually in the first round, whereas this one was a between rounds thing. Let me go it up. So I I didn't know that. Let me ask you, I guess a follow up question on that fact, because um, obviously, especially at this point, they don't do it as much, but it still happens. There's always advertisements from like clubs or certain places, especially in Vegas, that are hosting like fighter parties afterward with the fighters. And I know you pay to get in, all that kind of stuff, and maybe you get to party with them, and you, regardless of a win or a loss. And I always wondered, like, in a situation like that, because obviously Ken lost this fight. How was he the rest of the night? You know, um, some some of them are, you know, he at that time in his career, he he's experienced, you know, he's already lost before he didn't wouldn't want to lose. So they're they're dude, they're just the same. They're almost more uh, calm and level headed and and clear than they are throughout their training camp. And they're all wired and they're all like just crazy. Uh, it's it's just weird that like my brother, uh, you know, always thought he was hot shit. But once he would go and have a fight, whether he won or lost, he would uh, there would be like a humbleness uh, there with them after, and and he would always want to go and have fun and enjoy himself because they they put so much time in, and usually they got they made enough money to enjoy themselves. So thankfully Ken did. Um, I I was young at this point, so I didn't get to go to the after party on this one. I believe it was the second one that I was with my brother that I, I got to go to the after party because I was still too young at this one. My brother went to this after party or whatever they did i stayed in the hotel like a young buck smoking weed and uh you know they did their thing but the two was worse bro um i i that's when i realized how damaging uh mma was and i, I just knew that like one day possibly that could happen to my brother um his face getting battered so badly but uh, ken is a savage man he, he didn't he doesn't even care didn't have no fear um he literally acts like you you just slapped him and it's just unreal the amount of heart that he has um that's why he's the king of the lions then and that's why he is who he is but let's not get this twisted that's not ken shamrock in his prime um that was that was to for ken to make money and for the ufc to make money off them so uh, it just was a great experience great fight but it, it wasn't ken in his prime so i just i wish i could have seen them uh, a little bit better of a matchup yeah their ages never quite linked up well because even when he was really in his prime tito was super young um do you know if because they fought two more times and uh the sec because this is 2002 like we're talking about and um then they fought twice in 2006 uh, three months apart, uh, if I remember right. They, were, they both ended in the first round with technically victories going towards Tito, but I remember there being some type of a question of the finish in, uh, I guess, would be the second fight. That was UFC 61, and then uh, it's a UFC final chapter is at 64. The final chapter... Oh, no, that was the one on Spike. That's right, because they uh, they were coaches of the Ultimate Fighter, so that, that one was, wasn't a pay-per-view. That one was just... Uh, on TV. Uh, so do you know if it was a pay-per-view that you went to for the second one that you went out afterward or was that the third one that was on Spike TV? You know, that's a good question. Uh, I was in 2006, I was 21, so that that seems about right for uh 
the time because Kendall Grove was on his team was on the team Tito Ortiz, and that's when I started liking Tito more because Kendall Grove was my brother's good friend. We were hoping that my brother was going to get on the Ultimate Fighter uh, on Ken Shamrock's team, and he didn't get on that season. It was also, I think, middleweight, so it was a little bit bigger. Um, but then uh, John's uh, War Machine's chance came in a little bit down the road. But um, I, I, I think it actually might have been three, dude. That it was, like, been, cause it, it was it three. Was, it if, was three. If Kendall Grove was on the card, then it was three, because I know he was on that card. Actually, I think it he was, was three. the coming event on that fight card. Oh, okay, yeah. cool. No, I mean they were super close together. That's why it's like I, I, you know it's almost surprising how close they were together. I don't not remember, but. If they're that close, it had to be a controversial stoppage. I don't know why I'm spacing. They they were so close together. I think I have the two fights like blended in my head because I remember the the ultimate fight of the season, um, and like the whole season and then the final. So I don't, I don't know. Spacing yes. out a little bit here UFC on the interview, guys. Yeah, because the second time was UFC 61, and Herb Dean did his little controversial stoppage a little too early. So it, I, I kind of blocked. Two's kind of blocked out as nothing. Three is two, if that makes sense. <laughs> No, I, I, got, I got you on that one. That, there's plenty of fights like that. Um, sometimes the result still ends up being similar, but yeah, you never know with that result. Well, you know what, everybody? That was UFC 40. Uh, very much enjoyed re-going over that one. I'm happy that that was the first one Mike was at because then we got to go back and do it. And some of these older ones, you forget how action-packed they were. Some of it is because there was a, some lopsided fights made i mean at the time you don't know they're lopsided but with ending with some uh, amazing finishes and stuff like that a lot less decisions obviously like there wasn't even a decision on this entire fight card um although as short small of a fight card as it was which again i think we should go back to um uh minor news just the fact that ufc 249 they're still planning on having on may 9th uh People are kind of guessing at the location. I heard some people, not sure how serious, or just joking that it's going to be in Florida for obvious reasons we went over on the last show. But it's still going to be called UFC 249, the next fight card in May, if they can do it. They're not skipping that and going to 250. And it was a banger of a card. We listed all the fights that are supposed to be on it. Although one that is already off of the fight card, so I hate to say it, but it's almost like dominoes. This is just the first one. Amanda Nunez has pulled out saying she is not going to fight on that fight card because she needs more time to train to defend the featherweight title against Felicia Spencer. So that one's looking like they're going to push it to June. Honestly, I'm just hopeful that it happens because it's going to be something that once the first fight can get through, it'll be easier for ones going forward. So I guess I'm just hopeful that it actually happens, and I'm going to be positive and say it's going to happen. What do you think, Mike? Are you thinking that the main, the new May 9th date is going to happen, or no? Oh, man. I, 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 would, I want to say yeah, because the business is business and money's money, So, but I don't know, man. I don't trust anything. I just want to see some sports and something normal go back to... the just our lives just go back to normal pretty much with you on that one well everybody before we go just as a reminder we did a full breakdown of the next few weeks what we're doing this one we're going over ufc 40 we actually came up with three events but we're going to go in chronological order of those three events obviously there's some space in between them but the next one we are going to go over is pride fc 33 so if you would please 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 watch that before the next fight card it will make everything make so much more sense and uh this is, is the second fight card that pride had in the United States, it's Pride 33, the second coming. Just as a quick overview of some of the amazing fights on this fight card. Dan Henderson fought Wanderlei Silva for the 205 title in the main event. Nick Diaz fought Takanori Gomi. Mauricio Shogun Hua fought Alistair Overeem back when Alistair Overeem was a 205er. Sergey Karatana fought. Mac Danzig fought. This is actually, if I, time-wise, this is before... The tough finale where we talked about Mac Danzig. This is even before that. Um, so could you fought on this card versus uh, Rogerio Nogira, Travis View, who we just talked about losing tonight. Guess what? You know what? Spoiler alert: He lost on that fight card too. Frank Trigg fought on that fight card. Like it is a stacked card. So we went over a fight from 2002 today. We're gonna go over that fight, which is from Saturday. February 24th, 2007, Pride FC 33, and then after that one, we are going to jump 
to UFC 126 in Vegas. That was my first live fight card that I attended. So I could have a little background information for you guys. That was the Anderson Silva versus Vitor Belfort. Rich Franklin versus Forrest Griffin. John Jones versus Ryan Bader. Like it, it was a in hindsight, a ridiculously stacked card compared to most of the pay-per-views we have now. But then again, so was Pride 33, and so was UFC 40. So, Mike, do you have anything final to say to everyone before we bid them adieu for another seven days? I can't uh, thank you guys enough for tuning in to the podcast. And, uh, you know, I love to grow stuff. And uh, check out uh, the Instagram. Uh, it's, they're called Wave Genetics. It's wave.genetics. Uh, they, they have some of the most fire uh, cannabis seeds out there right now. So if you want to grow the, the most potent gas around, uh, go check them out and tell them that uh, Mike from MMA for Money sent you. Well, and actually, since we're going to throw out tags, Mike, you got to give everybody your amazing barbecue Instagram handle to see that delicious meat you're cooking and also your gardening one. Depending what you guys are into, Mike's got some yeah. stuff going on that you guys should follow. You can follow me on, a, on IG on Copes, Copes Q, K-O-P-E-S-Q. That's my uh, barbecue catering company, and I do a bunch of uh, just food posts. And then uh, Mr. Green Thumb 3 if you want to get some growing tips and if you want to see some pretty stuff. As always, please rate, review, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Check out the awesome little snippet videos we give you on YouTube. Comment. Let us know what you like, what you don't like. If it's a video you hate, you know what? Let us know that you hate it, what you want us to change. We have a nice breakdown of the whole show on YouTube. We have snippets of the segments. We have full breakdowns. When it gets further and we actually have fights to break down, that will be broken down by individual fights. We have some amazing guys on our end that are doing that work for us to give you guys as much content as you can handle. Now, we will see you in seven days for Pride FC 33. And with that, let's roll. Mm -hmm.